Good to see you guys this morning. Glad you made it through the rain. Where is Michelle when I need her? Help me with all these random songs. I sent her a video clip of a weatherman who randomly throws in 80s songs into his forecast. I don't know if you've seen that. Hilarious. He did uh, uh, Bon Jovi the other day. He talked about And he, he randomly would just say, you know, hey, we're over here and we're just living on a prayer. He would just randomly... Say things during tour. All right, three announcements real quick. Number one, uh, I don't know how many of you know Millie. She came Saturday night with Laura and uh, Marcus and sat right back here. Her and three other friends that Marcus and Laura started bringing to church a little over a year ago. She passed away uh, uh, this week. Suddenly, um, uh, she got pneumonia and uh, was gone within a few days. And so her service is going to be next Sunday over at their clubhouse, which is right over here at Lost Lakes. Um, and uh, we'll try to let you know details online uh, if you're participating. Feel free to do that. Number two is uh, people said, how can we give money to North Carolina? What's the best way to give? And so because we uh, were planning on leaving tomorrow for the Black Mountain Children's Home, basically it would be a burden to them for us to try to go there now. And so instead we're going to send funds to them if you, there's two ways you can do it. Um, you can get on uh, our church website and under our uh, Tithely, there is a drop down on the drop down menu that says Black Mountain Children's Home or Asheville or something, something related. You'll, you'll figure it out. Or if you write a check to Surfside and in the memo line, you put for Black Mountain Children's Home or Black Mountain or Children's Home, anything like that, we'll make sure it gets to the right category um, we'll, we'll send money up this week. We'll send, we'll do our best this week and then, and then try to send some money up next week. They have a lot of needs. Um, their children's buildings were not flooded, thankfully, where they house with the foster families. Uh, but all of their other buildings are flooded. Their thrift store to which, which they make a lot of their extra money with all of their campsite, the, the whole campsite not only flooded, but buildings destroyed. The water just went through there. And that's where they put teams up. It's where they cook meals. It's where they host events for families. And it's just, that's just destroyed. So anyway, all that to say that they, anything we send them, they'll use. I have been uh, and been a part of and seen what they do. I know people who were foster parents um, who I've known for 20 and 30 years. And they all say wonderful things about the Black Mountain Children's Home, so we feel like that's a good place to give. Um, the Southern Baptists, you guys who give to our church, just so you know, uh, we give a percentage every single month, and part of that goes to disaster relief, and they've had groups up there from the day after the storm, um, and that's one reason that we partner together. We don't have to wait to collect supplies. We don't have to wait to pull things together. You guys, without even knowing it, have already sent supplies and shower trucks and food trucks and uh, all kind of things up there. And of course, you know, many of you are aware of Samaritan's Purse and other things. But if you look up um, uh, disaster relief and want to see what they've done, or if you look on our webpage, I'll post pictures now and then of what they're doing um, and the different groups. Hundreds and hundreds and maybe even thousands of uh, Southern Baptists are already up there helping and serving. Uh, a third announcement. Uh, please keep an eye on the weather this week. And uh, if you're in a low-lying house or anything, please take care of yourself. I know that you want to be stubborn, and you're a hero. And one thing I've learned from my friends in North Carolina, who I saw the water just wash their house away, is just go, where, go and get where you need to go and get. You don't have to drive 500 miles. You can drive 30 miles and get out of the path. We don't know the track yet, so just pay attention and um, anyway, all that to say, I, my family went through the hurricane on Lake Okeechobee where there used to be an island. And my grandmother uh, actually worked for the postmaster at that time and went to, in the 30s, to evacuate the island in Lake Okeechobee. And all the people said, we've all been fine. We'll be fine this time. And none of them survived it. So anyway, all that to say that just be smart and be wise. God has given you wisdom. Um, uh, you know, the Bible says, uh, uh, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And uh, uh, so just be wise in what you do. Uh, be gentle in what you do. Be nice to each other out there. Don't cut anybody off at the gas line or wherever you're going to go. But anyway, and if you need help, we'll be here. We're not going anywhere. 
uh, building or not, we'll be here. Um, uh, parking lot or not, we'll be here. And um, so just so you guys know, we're here for you. People all the time will ask me, what do we do if there's a big crisis? I said, we'll do what we've always done. We'll partner together to make a difference. And by the way, in North Carolina, can I tell you who's making the biggest difference? Churches. Uh, that doesn't make the news, that doesn't get on, even on social media a lot, but churches are the ones hosting feedings and taking care of people and checking on their members. And so God created this community for this kind of purpose. So I'm glad you're here today, and um, thanks for sneaking out. So today we're going to continue. We're going to be in Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to do a survey. I'm very excited about it. I was actually a little shocked by the results of my survey last night, I have to admit, So we're going to start with you. How many of you at your home have some charging cables for your devices? Anybody here have charging almost unanimous, ignanimous? All right. So we're going to, I want you to estimate in your head. Now, some of you are going to give a very rough estimate because you have no idea how many you have. Uh, And by the way, I will count car also because some of you are pack rats and put cables in your car too, like many, not a couple. Bunches, like, is there a bunch? He elbowed you. Okay, who has over 20 charging cables in their house or car? Okay, how many over 30? Over 30 charging cables in your house or car? You can raise your hand. You don't don't have to be scared. Okay, anybody over 40? I have over 40 charging cables. So nobody over 40. Well, that's good. Last night we had two people over 40. And everybody looked at them and said, you're crazy. No, they didn't. One guy's a tech guy, so he kind of has an excuse. Like, if you do that for a living, you're like allowed to be a maniac pack rat. So, do you have that many and you're just not raising your hand? Is that what's happening here? Okay. It's all right. We still love you. And no matter how many you have, we still love you. And I would encourage you, if you have a battery backup, to charge it this week. Okay. So, sorry, this is random. So, so here's the thing about a charging cable. All of us have had the experience of picking up our phone or device and realizing that even though we thought it was plugged in, it was not. And we picked up our phone or whatever device and it was at nothing, right? You got maybe even not a symbol, so you maybe even thought your phone was broken, which was a crisis, I'm sure, right? right? And, you, and you didn't know it wasn't charging, and then it wasn't. And so from then on, you're like, well, don't use that cable anymore, or don't use that port anymore, or don't, right? You start making decisions based on where it comes from. So here we go. Now, let's get spiritual for a minute. This is church. We've had enough phone IT tech for the day. By the way, clean out the bottom of your iPhone with a little needle or a toothpick, get that junk out of there or your charger will not work. All right. So without knowing it sometimes, if you're not careful, even though you're reading your Bible, even though you're going to church, even though you're doing the spiritual things you've always done, you can quit charging if you're not connecting with the Christ who you're reading about. If you're not careful, the Bible would become a history book to you and you won't take what the Bible says and let it change you. Because you can read the Bible all day long. The the Pharisees and Sadducees read the Bible their whole life. They memorized more of the Old Testament than you and I will ever memorize. And yet, it didn't sink in. It went here, but it never made it here. And so, I want to give you... Three things. This story, chapter 8, has so many great stories, and we're not going to be able to go through all of them. That's just a a matter of practicality. Uh, But I encourage you, I'm hoping that this study is giving you a taste of each, each passage and that it's making you hungry to go, okay, so what happened here? And and to read a little more context, to understand what was going on, um, because Luke does a great job. He has gathered the stories. He's not one of the disciples. He's gathered the stories. He's put them together in detail, like a doctor would, uh, with all the details, and and he presents them to us. And there's little things in here uh, uh, that teach us, not just about Jesus, but today, specifically, how can we grow in the power of Christ? So let's look at that, and, uh, and I want to talk about this idea of being distracted, but yet preparing uh, for Christ to work in you. Number one, 
grow by preparing your heart. So we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 8, verse 4 through 8. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on. The birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Everybody in Florida understands this. Everybody, right? I've got some plants that are in pots that I, every time I look at, I'm like, how is this dying? Well, because it doesn't, there's not enough room for enough water, right? So the plants were there. Why? They had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, I, there's an illustration that comes from this for pastors, but it's also for you. And uh, over the years, I can remember calling Harold Brantley and, you know, maybe sometimes calling him and saying, I felt like my sermon wasn't going anywhere today. Or I felt like I messed this up or did that. And he said, Eric, all you're responsible for is spreading the seed. They're responsible for what happens with it. And so that's true for you, too. You need to understand. Listen, and, and I, I talk to a lot of people uh, in relational trouble, whether it's with their teenagers or their spouse. And, and let me tell you a, a little key. You cannot control and you will hurt yourself trying to control another person and their response. But you can control what you do, what you throw. And so I've warned a lot of guys about anger. I said, you know, instead of seed, you're throwing gasoline. That doesn't help the plants. You know, be careful what you plant. But the truth is you can't be responsible for how someone responds to you. And so th that's true at work. That's true at home. It's true when you tell somebody about Jesus. It's true when you talk about your relationship with Christ. All of that's true. And here, Jesus is specifically talking about this idea of us hearing from the Bible, hearing what Jesus is saying to us, and then what are we going to do with it? And so he then, the disciples did what they always do. I love the disciples. The disciples make me feel smart. Because the whole time, as Jesus is teaching the disciples, they're like nodding. Yeah, we get it. Yeah, we get it. They get Jesus in private. They're like, what was that? We have, we have no idea. I mean, even when Jesus says to them, I'm going to die. He's doing the Lord's Supper. He's like, tomorrow, I'm going to die. And they're like, which one of us is first? Like, where have you, what have you guys been doing? And I'm like, I could have at least caught the side note of that one, you know? And so the disciples, uh, once again, are like, what does that story mean? And then Jesus, uh, uh, in verse 11, goes into detail. So listen to this. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. By the way, one thing about seeds, and if you took one of those classes when you were a little kid and you took the bean and you put it, put it in the water and you watch this, one of the things about seeds is seeds, good seeds, are alive. But that's why you have to be careful what you buy for your yard, right? Because you ever look on the back the number of weeds that you're planting? You're actually planting weeds. Did you know that? If you buy uh, grass seed, guess what? There's a percentage of it that's not grass. Right? And, and this truth is, what you read and what you look at and what you allow in your life is the seed that you're allowing to be planted. What are you letting soak in? Okay, so, so seeds are alive. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so they may not believe and be saved. Basically, they hear it, and they instantly are like, na, 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 na. like I was teaching the kids, I'm going to have some parents mad at me. I am certain of that. Pastor Harry told us to do... Your daughter, your, Chad's going to kill me. Sorry. She, maybe she already does it. No, no. I taught her something new. That's great. That's great. That's just great. All right. So, they believe for a while, but in the time... Oh, excuse me, excuse me. When they hear it... Let me go back. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy. Thank you so much for the word. I can't do a rocky... Give me a Sylvester Stallone. What you got? Nothing? You got nothing? Everything I do sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Peter Lord. 
which sounds the same, actually. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. They're like, wow, pastor, that was a great sermon. But they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. By the way, we all go through times of testing. We all go through difficulties. We all go through trials. And sometimes we don't know what we're made of until the trial comes. Sometimes we don't know what a bridge is made of until a time of testing comes. Sometimes we don't know what our house is made of until a time of testing. You get the idea. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, and I think this is most common for most of us, who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. So the seed is there, the plant is there, but because they get worried about other things, or they get focused on other things, or they get distracted by other things, we live in a distracted world, right? It doesn't, it doesn't grow. They don't continue to meditate on the Word. But the seed on good soil stands for those, I love this, with a noble and good heart. This is the idea of having no hypocrisy. They're not doing it just for show. They're doing it with a noble heart. For the right reasons, they're listening. They're reading God's Word. Who hear the Word, retain it, and then it says, by persevering. You know what persevering is? Persevering is keep going when things are tough. So it says, and persevering they produce a crop. And then we know that it's a huge crop. We know that sowing is always bigger. So let me uh, tell you what it's like. I, I have hard pan in my yard. I had no idea what hard pan was. I, I had heard of hard pan. I had no idea what it was, but I have some in my yard. I grew up in Miami. Now in Miami, my dad would take us down to Homestead and he would say, we're going to dig footers for this house. And we would take a pickaxe, and, and the first inch was awesome. The dirt would come right up, and then we would hit coral rock. And we would swing and swing. And I can remember one house specifically, we went about a foot an hour. A foot an hour. Just chink, 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 12 inches deep, one foot. And I can remember, it was miserable. Well, I was out of my yard, and I was planting some some grass seed. I had one area where nothing was growing. And I'm like, this is really strange. So I got my pickaxe out and I thought, what is this soil like? And I swung and it bounced off the top. And I went, this is coral rock without holes. It was unbelievable. So I actually went and bought a bit, a bit for my drill. And now I go out in my yard and I go, me. And the neighbors think I'm nuts because they're wondering why I'm walking around with a drill in my yard. But it's awesome. And it drills down and it pulls up the soil. And what does it do? It softens all the soil. And guess what? The places I never had dirt, I got dirt now. Now, here's the thing. Your life, the hurts you have, unforgiveness you have, distractions that you have, frustrations that you have, hurts you, hang-ups that you have, habits that you have... All of those can, can get the soil of your heart hard. And so one of the things we have to do is say, God, look at my heart. We need to pray the prayer that David prayed for himself. David could have been an arrogant jerk, but he was a humble man. And, and the Bible talks about it. He's a man after God's heart, totally flawed, totally messed up. But he said, God, see if there's any wayward way in me. Is there any area of my life I need to clean up? Because the truth is, if we're going to prepare our heart to hear God's word, what the Bible says to us, what his word says to us, if it's going to be planted deep, guess what? We got to deal with the junk. We, we got to deal with the junk in our lives. Listen to these three tips to grow in his word in you. Number one, prepare your heart through confession and praise. Confession is like cleaning out your garage. Nobody just goes in their garage and starts moving stuff around. First, if they're really going to do a good job, they go in on a nice day, hopefully, and pull everything out because you've got to figure out what's there. The truth is, confession's about figuring out what's there. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would examine my heart. Lord, is there pride? Is there arrogance? Is there selfishness? Is there self-centeredness? Is there anger? Is there unforgiveness? Is there bitterness? Is there in a, ingratitude? Lord, am I just lazy? Whatever it is, and you just confess it to God. God, you know I'm dealing with this. Clear my heart. Why? So that he can plant new seed in you. So 
Take time for confession, and then take time for praise. Because here's the deal. If you just stay in the confession, oh, I'm so messed up, I'm so broken, if you're not careful, that actually can become selfish. That actually can become about you. And you can be all about, woe is me. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Think I'm going to eat worms. Right? Are you singing the rest of the song? Right? And so... And so if you're not careful, your confession can actually become a selfish thing. That's weird, right? So what do you have to do? You receive forgiveness. You thank God for His forgiveness. You praise Him for His love for you. You praise Him for His forgiveness for you. And you change your focus from me, 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 me to thee, 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 thee. I know I want King James on you. Number two. Spend time in His Word, reading His Word, listening to His Word. We have more Bible available than any generation in the history of earth. And yet, we let it just go through. Spend time. Spend time in His Word. And then number three goes along with that. Meditate and memorize His Word. Meditation, the word for meditation, is like what a cow does to grass. Now, I know none of us live on farms with cows that I know of. Some of us have donkeys, yes, but not the same. All right. So, okay, I, I've been a donkey. I'm, I was told I was a donkey, and I tell people God uses donkeys all the time every Sunday. All right, so here's the deal, though. Cow, what does he do? Swallows the grass, right? Enjoys it for a little bit, and then brings it back. And, and to give a, a more modern illustration, it's like the little girl in Willy Wonka that has the gum, and, and she chews it, puts it behind her ear, chews it, puts it, it's disgusting, right? Right? She just keeps, and I've had this for weeks now, right? Weirdo. But the truth is, that's what you should do with God's Word. You should read God's Word and ask Him to apply it to your life. Get a verse that means something to you. Maybe something you're dealing with. Maybe a struggle you're happening, happening in you. If you're struggling with lust, Job 31.3, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully upon a girl. Put that in your uh, 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 memos. Make that part of your life. If you're struggling with anger, there's tons of verses on anger. And, and what's great is now you can actually Google, the pagan Google, and find verses that you need to memorize. And so find some verses, put them in a place where you can roll them over and over. Why? Because you realize that is a hard spot in my life. I need to change that. How do I do it? I let the roots of God's word grow deep. I've got some trees in my yard that are taking up my driveway. My driveway is strong, but guess what? Tree roots are stronger. When you let God's word get deep in your heart, I know you've got some areas in your life that are tough. Let God's word penetrate it and say, God, would you penetrate my heart with your word? Would you make that make a difference in me? Because the Holy Spirit can do that. You can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not smart enough, uh, uh, disciplined enough or anything else, but God can do it. Number two, grow by facing the storms. Grow by facing the storms. They, I love the studies on, on buffalo. I think it's on buffalo or bison or whatever they are, where they talk about they're the only animal that when a storm comes, not only do they face the storm, but they walk towards the storm to try to get out of the storm. And the truth is, you can not want to think about stuff, you can not want to deal with stuff, but sometimes you just got to realize I'm in it. Listen to what happens. One day, Jesus said to his disciple, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. And this is a really different word for falling asleep. Um, uh, It's kind of like the idea of you're trying to stay awake, but you can't. Like some of you right now. Right? You done that one? That's fun. I can remember falling asleep in church and my head hitting the pew. And it made a loud noise and woke me up. Woke me up, right? Dunk, right? Okay, so Jesus, what? He's so tired, he falls asleep. By the way, this is another one of the signs that Jesus is fully God, but but he's also fully man. And so he dealt with the weakness, the struggles that we have. And so here he is, he falls asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Now, time out. These are fishermen. They are not Eric Brookins. I'm in a boat. It gets a a millimeter of water, and I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? Let's go in. What's going on, right? No, fishermen are like, eh, it's a little water. 
Eh, it's waist deep now. I mean, I don't know what they're dealing with, but it's so bad. They say the boat is being swamped. We're all going to die. Wake up Jesus. But he doesn't want to be woken up. I don't care. Wake him up anyway. Master, master, we're going to drown. I love this. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided and was calm. Can you imagine? So now, as freaked out as the disciples were, they're more freaked out. They're, they've exponentially gotten more freaked out, and now they're not freaked out about the storm. They're freaked out about Jesus. Listen to what it says. In fear, which means freaking out, and amazement. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Who's this dude? They asked one another, Who is this? Who is this? He commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. There's times in life you're going to go through something that's difficult. By the way, you realize it's Jesus' fault that they're on the lake. Jesus knew about the storm. No matter who you are, storms are going to come in your life. Things that you don't like, emotions you don't like, the way you feel. Sometimes it has to do with your mental health. Sometimes it has to do with your physical health. Sometimes it has to do with other people. There are going to be things you don't like. Are you going to say, with Jesus, I can face it. Lord, I need your help. Lord, you're more powerful than this storm. And for some people, all I pray for them is that they would know. Let me tell you, so I visit people a lot of times when they're dying. And one of the things I say a lot to people who are dying is what I would say to you sometimes when you're going through a hard time. Hold the hand of Jesus. If he leads you somewhere you go, so if somebody's on their deathbed, I say, you, you've held Jesus' hand for a long time. Hold his hand today, and if he leads you to heaven, you go with him. But if he tells you to stay here, you stay here. But go with him, and you'll be okay. And I want to tell you, no matter what you're walking through, go with him, and you'll be okay. I know you're worried about your list. you got a list of worries, right? He, he knows your list, by the way. He's not surprised by it. But you say, Jesus, I know you're going to walk me through this. Now, we would love to know what's on the other side, but he never gives us advance warning. He didn't tell the disciples, let's go out into that storm. But they're in the storm. But he's with them. And we all feel like Jesus is asleep sometimes. But he's not. He knows. Number three. Grow by walking in faith. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. This is a great detail. And a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. Another place in scripture it says she spent all her money on doctors. I notice Luke doesn't say that. Isn't that, isn't that funny? She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Many people think it was just one of the tassels. And immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter, the impulsive disciple who cut the guy's ear off, said, can I walk on water? I mean, this is the guy who's like blurting, right? Had some ADD qualities to him. He looks at Jesus, he's like, um, uh, uh, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Which, thank you, Captain Obvious, it's my response. If I was Thomas, I'd be like, thank you, Captain Obvious. Jesus knew that. But then Jesus says this, someone touched me. I know that power is gone from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling, fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, listen, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Let me tell you what it's like to walk in faith. You know, the Bible says your word is a lamp unto my feet. It doesn't say your word is a spotlight. It doesn't say your word is bright lights. And I don't know, you know, Fort Christmas Road gets fog all the time. 
But I drive on Fort Christmas Road a lot. So I'll be honest, when the fog's there, I'm like, mm, just watch out for animals. I almost hit some turkeys this morning, by the way. My friends go hunting for turkeys. I almost hunted for turkeys by accident. <laughs> so driving, not a big deal. But if I go to the mountains in North Carolina that are curvy, and I don't know what's next, and the fog comes in, now I don't stop because I know some maniac behind me is not stopping. But can I tell you, I slow down, and I pay attention to where I'm headed next. Listen, when the fog of uncertainty comes into your life, when difficulty comes in, when struggles come in, please don't stop. But it's okay to go slow. And it's okay to say, Jesus, I don't know what I'm supposed to do down the road, but I know what I'm supposed to do next, so I'm going to take the next step. Don't worry about the next 25 steps. I know you got a plan. I know you got to prepare. The Bible talks about prayer and preparation. I'm talking about worry. You know the difference. And just say, I'm going to do this next right thing. When the fog of uncertainty, the fog of being afraid sets in, just say, God, give me the next thing. If you'll do these three things, if you'll ready your heart, meditate on Scripture, you'll allow His Word to sink into your heart. If you'll trust Him with everything, then He will walk you through and give you His power to walk through. And you'll know that He's with you. Sometimes the only thing I pray for people, and I pray for my children all the time, Lord, help them to know Your presence. Lord, in a world that's dark, in a world that's angry, in a world that promotes fear and frustration, Lord, help them to know your presence. Why? Because even in the middle of all that, you know what he does? He jumps up and goes, no more storm. And so even though the world around you is raging, where you are is peace that passes all understanding. I'm praying that you'd have that. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step to knowing his power is to surrendering your life to him. So if you want to do that today, you can do that. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. If you're watching online, you can send me a note. Also, if you're here, you know, as I talk today, the Holy Spirit, I know, tells us things, reminds us of things, points out things. Just make that area right with God or commit to say, God, I'm going to do that. I'm going to spend time in your word. I'm going to spend time in prayer. I'm going to find a verse that has to do with that situation and then do it. Don't let the Fruit that's been planted in your heart, die. Let it grow in you. Let's close in prayer. Join me. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. I thank you for your love for us. Father, may we know your presence. I pray for that one today who's dealing with a lot of fear. Lord, that one who's dealing with a lot of frustration. Lord, that right now they would know your power. Lord, that you would hold their hand. Father, I pray for that one who, who's looking for answers in a situation that they would just take the next step knowing that you're going to hold their hand and walk them through. Thank you for this time today. Thank you for your love for us, Lord. Bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen.